How's everybody doing? Good. Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm tired, but I'm here. I'm Let's see. How do I do trying this? to do all my what seems like end of year stuff already and going a little nuts. <laughs> Janie's good to oh. see. You. Janie's still connecting to audio. Here's Miss Betsy. Give people a I minute. like your new photos with the models. Oh, yeah. Aren't those fantastic? Um, yeah. If you have a bunch of three to 10 artists in your neck of the woods that are interested in model shoots, the photographers are traveling. And so if they happen to be in your neck of the woods, they can set up a day or two of shooting and they find a local model through agencies that they work with. It is not cheap, but they're amazing photographers. Um, mm -hmm. super cool people, very relaxed, keep you all relaxed. Uh, and the results, as you can see, are pretty professional. Yeah. Uh, it looks so, really good. It yeah, looks where, really did, good. where is this? Where um, did you post that? Oh, I've been using them periodically in my uh, social media stuff. And I think I had a, I must have had a, a scheduled um, reel on Instagram. Oh, okay. Uh, I just haven't been on Facebook or yeah. Instagram. Uh, it, it, so it would have been on, it might have made it through. It's, sometimes the reels make it to both and sometimes the reels only make it to Instagram. Um, but uh, the model was a, an Oregon local named St. Marie. And she was incredibly professional and amazing. And we had seven different artists, um, I think seven, maybe even eight that got shots done. Um, and she had a whole bunch of different outfits that she could switch into depending on what looks good. And Scott Herb and Donna Dufo, who are the photographers, um, they're old friends of mine, but I've also worked with them. For, I worked with them professionally even before I really knew them. Um, and uh, they've done stuff for other business things for me and so on. And um, they're just incredible. They took, they did a day of headshots for the people that wanted headshots for their websites. And everybody was ecstatic with those. And then they did a day of shooting and um, they would take hundreds and hundreds of shots. And then you would have to narrow it down. And that was the really hard part because you get a certain <laughs> shot with each. You can buy extras, but you don't need to. So you get one as part of the package for each of the shoots that you do with them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's absolutely worth it to get a couple of really good people shots. So those are now, a couple of those uh, are now going to be signage in the back of my booth instead of my banner that just has the imagery. Um, you usually, you chop it down a little bit when, um, when you're doing that kind of work. So that's not really about the people so much as the people wearing the jewelry, but um, I'm going to see how that signage does for me. So I haven't seen Janie in a long time. Welcome, Janie. Hello, hello. Betsy, good to see you, even if we're not seeing you. Um, give people another minute, and then there's a boatload of info I want to dump your way in addition to today's, hopefully, finishing. <sighs> what was that, Paula? Nothing. I oh, have to turn thought you said something. Um, so other than that, my next show is my last show of the season, I think. And it is in November in Seattle. If you're up in the Seattle area, November. Oh my gosh, I don't even know. It's like three weeks away. I've got so much to do between now and then. It is the best of the Northwest. And it is the weekend of uh, November 10th. Um, and it's a really lovely little show if you're up in that neck of the woods. Um, so swing by and say hi, if you happen to be there. Um, what else do I need to cover? We do still have availability in the clasps workshop that is coming up and that is, um, uh, November 17th through 19th, the weekend after that show. And then there are still definitely spots in the live hollow forms class that's in person down in usually very sunny and lovely beachy Long Beach, California at the Diane Weimer Studios. A nice little three-day vacation if you need one. Um, and I do want to find out from you guys that have been showing up on the regular, whether there are any classes you definitely want to make sure I cover somewhere, whether it's virtually or live, um, in 2024. So feel free to send ideas my way. And I'm going to spotlight myself before I forget. Hey, sorry. Uh, you're just good. Yeah. All good. Good to see you. Thank you. 
Um, so let's see what other things we've got the usual, all the previous recordings. I'm, I think I'm caught up. I think I got last time's up pretty quickly. Um, so all of the previous recordings are up on the YouTube at Eclectic Nature Jewelry. Um, you can see my workshops on my website, um, and I'll have various links on a regular, on the regular, um, Facebook group and Instagram and so on. Um, and dun, 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 I want to show you, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. If you're interested in that clasps class, I have my array of many clasps out. This is just some of what we cover. Let me zoom, eh, zoom out a little bit first and then we'll zoom in. So, um, in that three day class, it's a bit of a whirlwind. We spend our first day learning an array of different wire based clasps most of which I demo and then a couple of which I just talk about. So even if you've made um, some traditional hook and eyes before and so on, we talk about some of the variations on the theme of ways to make a sturdier one, how to integrate them with your chains, some, some fun var variations on decorating them and so on. And then there's some kinds of clasps like this, which are technically a hook and an eye still, but they're a little bit funkier. Um, so we're going to go into some of those demos, and those can be various shapes. Um, we're going to talk about toggle clasps a lot and what you can do to give some variety even to your basic toggle clasps, as long as you get your proportions right so that you're getting enough of a cross piece. Um, but I like to do little elements to add, the little decorative stones and that sort of thing. Um, you can do them out of, if you've got some scrap wire of your pattern wire or your ring wire. You can just get some nice variations. You can do some little decorative beading around them, that sort of thing. Um, then uh, some more of the heavy gauge hook and eye clasps. These chains are not what I would normally put these on. When I do my demos, I uh, I just look for something that shows how, it, uh, how the chain works. Um, what else are we covering in that? And then we're going to do box clasps, both the basic style which um, is really boxy. And if you are already good at box clasps or want to stretch yourself, we do integrated into larger hollow forms and unusual shapes. But a lot of people are sort of intimidated by this as a concept. And once you get the basics of a box, box clasp down, it really opens up um, a lot of potential for other kinds of clasping mechanisms. Um, when you learn about how to make that really magical little click. So I don't actually use a whole lot of basic box clasps in my work, but I do extend the box clasp idea into integrated hollow form objects very frequently. Um, I'm going to show you this one just because it's so cool um, that I can't even stand it, but it's not one that I teach per se. It's a helicoid, and it is a little spinny thing that ends up on this um, on this coil, basically, and you just have to have enough spin to get your little eye off of it, and then you slide it back on. But what it's what's critical about it is it has this pivoting mechanism down at the bottom so that it doesn't just tangle up your necklace. As you go, it spins up the up the necklace center, right? It's cool. It's super cool. Really and, uh, cool. This was from, if you've got the Tabakovka, I'm sure I'm mangling the, uh, Anna Tabakovka's book on 4,000 years of clasps. You'll see pictures of this in there. I was, they, she doesn't give you directions. None of the, none of that book has directions, but I uh, spent a, a few weeks at one point trying to create as many as I could out of that clasp book. Um, and this was one of the challenging ones. So the key is that it has a little, um, tube setting that is the spin point, a little piece of tube, and then you've got to get this really challenging solder, which is to get the ring soldered onto the tube while the bead, the stopper is there, and make sure that it still spins so you don't solder it down to itself. Um, but otherwise, it's a really cool clasping mechanism based on ancient helicoid forms. And I happen to have this funny little chain that I picked up at a garage sale or something, and I thought it went well with it. Um, love I, it. Yeah. Isn't that a fun one? Yes. I love it. I cannot uh, show class. This one is not what I'm teaching in the class, but it's I can't show it without showing John Cogswell's clasp. Um, this was my very first John Cogswell class that I took from him was a class. It was two clasps in two days, and this was one of them. 
And then there was a, a rifle clasp in it as well. And none of us even finished the first one on that very first class I took. Um, but what it is, is a knocker clasp. And so there's this floating uh, knocker that snaps into place inside of the limbs of it. When it moves out of the way, you have a hook that can, an eye that can only get past when there's no knocker in the way. The other side of the link is holding the other side of the chain. And so once you close it up, then you have chain connected on either side. So that is a John Cogswell design. And I love the, this class, but it is a royal pain in the butt to make. Um, it is a lot of steps and a lot of precision. Uh, the other thing that we'll be talking about in the upcoming class is keyhole clasps. And we're gonna do both open keyholes, which are sort of the easier version, and then these built-in keyhole clasps where what you have is a little locking point that slides on and then it when it rotates past it, it locks into place. Um, so those are fun and they don't have to be round, but round is the, so they're all hard getting the precision you need. Round is the one that it's easiest to get looking good is the way that I would put it because it has a fairly constant shape to it. And it's a, something that we have many of the tools to form it with. Um, and so you can see I'm, I've got one that I haven't attached to anything, so you can make them different sizes, but there's only one position in which the hook will come out, and you can see it's got a very specific little stubby top to it, and what you have is as tight a fit as you can make it to get that in there so it doesn't come loose on its own. Um, I've got a couple class. too. Yeah, isn't mm -hmm. that a neat one? I've got yeah. a couple that I'm not teaching in this round, but I, I alternate in when I either do these or these. And this is um, basically, it's a hinge type mechanism and your clasp mechanism is a very snug fit inside of it. So this is, this pin never comes out all the way and that's the tough part on these. And then when you close it, it pushes down. And this is great for bracelets, for, um, strands of beads and so on. And it doesn't have to be round. It doesn't have to specifically be hingy, but it becomes, oh, I'm doing a little too much pulling on this one. Um, it becomes the, the centerpiece of bracelet or choker or whatever you're making with it. Um, and then you got a little decorative pull to add some things to. Um, it doesn't have to be done as a an enclosed box like that. It's just a little butterfly caterpillar kind of looking thing to me if it's not attached. But you could see you could put, instead of these little wussy chains, you could put strands of pearls or something like that. And the, the concept is still the same. There's a hinge and a pin that runs through it that locks it into place. Um, another one that I alternate in is this sliding toggle. I show you the most basic. The lentil sliding toggle is one that has a little knocker. You put it in one side and you pull it down. And this one counts on gravity helping. So this is for the front pendant. It doesn't work as a back clasp. And one of the things we go over in the clasp class is how to decide which is the most functional form balance for your project. Because what this is great for is as a pendant itself, it's not mm -hmm. as good for say a bracelet or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see it in smaller forms. Uh, I think I have another one. You can do an open version of it. So I did this one as a bracelet. But if you're doing it in an open form, you need to also add a little locking mechanism so that it can't get past that point until you've opened that latch up. And then you can go and toggle it. I love it as a concept. This is one of my least favorite in terms of likelihood of coming open. It's It's a very high likelihood that when somebody's moving around, it'll come open. But we talk about the form and the function of each of them and the benefits of the various things. Um, so that's what you get. That's the kind of thing you get in the clasps class if it's of interest to you. Question a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's one of those fire hose classes of mine. Um, the first day we go through boatloads of clasps and then the second and third day are one clasp each. Um, and you should not expect to make literally everything that we do in the class. What I'm trying to do is get you thinking about the mechanisms um, in such a way that you can now incorporate the idea of closures 
in your own work. And I'm a huge fan of if you're going to spend the time and energy making a custom closure, I'm um, in a custom chain or something like that, you might as well make a custom closure and level up a little bit. It's another fun one from that Tabakovka book, which is an angle slotted piece. It's actually unbelievably hard to open accidentally, um, but it takes a heavy weight material and it takes precision sawing to get that function. But that's a fun one. Questions or any of those that you wanted to get any thoughts on? <coughs> Excuse me. Are they heavy? Are they heavy yes. when you finish them? Depends on the chain, I mean, on the clasp. Um, like the hook eyes, you can make them lighter. You can make them heavy depending on your needs. Um, the hinge clasps tend to be a little on the heavier side. Um, the, the rotating toggle clasps, the keyhole clasps, they're actually pretty light because they're hollow forms. Uh, and you don't, because you're doming them, you don't need a whole lot of weight. I think I do those in 26 gauge usually, um, for the outer lump, and then it's heavier gauge plates for the inside to give them the, because the, the, the mechanism is the important part and that the rest is just structure, you know, storage. Um, that one that I just showed you that's a sliding one is pretty heavy because it's a, it needs the weight in order to key, in order to maintain its precision. Mm. I can see wearing a couple of them together, like that last <laughs> one you showed. You could just, yeah, just make a whole bunch of different clasp points all the way around. You'd have a yeah, great. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, so that's that. And again, that's up on my website if you want to register for it. Um, and that's enough of my promotion for now. Um, so let's get on to part D of the setting of the, I mean, of the making of the step bezel, the emerald cut step bezel. And so I'm going to tell you about my adventures since last we met, folks. Um, so I went to do the cleanup on the one that we, that you saw me make using John's techniques online. And I was not happy with the way it looked. I wasn't happy with the fit particularly. I wasn't happy with the tightness of my corners and the angles. Um, and so I went back and made it, the, made another one the way that I make them instead of the way that John described. And I ran into this last time too, and I should have remembered, um, but I'd promised I was going to try John's approach again. I do better on an emerald cut when I'm doing measuring a side at a time um, instead of the series of folds that he wants us to mark out and everything. Um, and so I'm doing a method where I'm doing a, an ed, a, a segment and make the fold, a segment and make the fold, a segment and make the fold. And I'm going to show you just how different the output was. Um, and I think I did this like the day after we, we did our last session. Um, but I am much, much happier with my way of doing it because of my lack of precision. When I'm measuring more carefully on each individual segment and making sure it's perfect or as perfect as I can make it before I go to the other one, I get better results. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and show you guys what I'm talking about. Let me get really close. Oops, wrong way. Really close. There's our lovely stone that we're working with. And here is the one that we worked on and did during last session for our outer frame. And Broadly, it fits the stone, broadly. But there's some extra on one of the corners. It's a little too wide. It's also not as flush and equal looking as I would like it to be. Um, I have to have that wax in there to manage this or else it just falls through. So that's what I got from that, that John Cogswell approach. Um, and then this is what I got for my fit when I did it the individual step at a time way. Oops, I got to get the right corner in there, but broadly, there we go. And it is a much, much cleaner fit. And it's a little hard to see on camera the difference until I take the one that I like and I place it in front of the one that I don't like. And you will see where my gaps are, right? Oh. Right? So yes. it's not squared up. I've got that extra wide. I pushed out a little more than I should. So there's pieces that line up pretty pretty solidly. Like I've got 
similar lengths on both of my short ends and I, most of my corners are good. And then there's the one overly wide corner that pushes the frame out a smidge more than it should be. So it is, that's my, my gapage that I'm worried about. So I'm gonna be working with the one I did after I left you guys. And I'm going to do this inner piece the same way that worked for me before, because otherwise we're gonna be here for a whole nother session or two. Um, and frankly, I want to get some success on an emerald cut because that's part of my journey in this project is to figure out what I need to do differently. And for me, even though what we're accomplishing is the same as what we're seeing on page 71, and a lot of the steps even parallel that, um, in that we're going to make the measurements carefully and we're going to hold, I'm going to use the three different set um, uh, calipers, dividers um, combination to get me there. I'm not going to be doing all of the layout the way it's drawn out at the bottom of page 71 in the book. I'm going to do a piece at a time. Um, I don't know why, but I personally find the interior layer of these easier than the outer because it has weirdly, even though it has to be a super snug fit, it weirdly has um, more room for error because remember, we're going to err on the side of too small for our interior line and then we can stretch it to fit. So we will have the ability to do that. Uh, as a reminder, John also gives us an option in the book to create our strip already made, in which case we would have a completed bezel out of this. But that's the one that, for me, makes it extra, extra hard to get the corners. It's really, really hard to do corrections when you're doing that. Um, I'm still at the right corner. So I'm, my goal is not entirely to work off of the stone at this point, but really now that I've got a good fit to work off of this with the stone as a guide. And what I'm gonna be doing is making my caliper measures to rest just at the edges of the stone. On the earlier ones, we gave ourselves that overage that John shows us how to do barely in the drawings um, where we're looking at the measurement that goes beyond. Remember I had you guys mark up the image number three on page 71. So that you were, so you got the reminder that we're not measuring from corner to corner of the stone so much as we're measuring corner to corner as if we were extending the diagonal beyond the metal that we are bumping up against it. So that was where we got our measurements on that. Um, but in this case, I'm actually wanting something that the stone will rest on. So because I know that I'm going to get a little um, closing in when I when I do my folds, I'm going to go to the exact corner to corner measurements for each of these. I don't remember, I think I used the biggest one for the biggest side and worked my way down. So, and as a reminder from last time, the stone that I chose is incredibly machine calibrated, which is the best thing ever when you're fighting to do this on, a, uh, on an emerald cut. Because if you have variants, you're gonna have nightmares. Although doing a segment at a time, um, having, if you have a different size on various corners, you know, if not all your corners match or whatever, um, you'll have an easier time of it uh, if you do one side at a time the way that we're about to do. Don't forget to zero out. And then we're gonna check for our corner to corner. So are you working on doing the inside of it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, What this is the step that it's going to rest on, which needs to be a tight, tight fit. I don't know if you remember all the way yeah. back to this section when we were doing rounds and so on, um, but we, we get it so tight that we have to hammer it in, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm checking for measurements that are just at the side, at the size of each corner and each length. And I'm setting all of the, oops, except that I wanted to do that for the medium, didn't I? I want to do the sizes that match. So this is my short end. 
go. Right, a little calibrated. And then I'm going to use my dividers because I don't have three electronic ones to get my corner, which is the one that's hardest to score and mark anyhow. So that's useful because my dividers can act as the scoring mechanism a little bit better than the mechanical ones can. Um, and I'll remind you guys that while this stone is machine cut, when we were first inspecting it, I realized that its facets are not perfectly lined up with its corners. So my facet on the on the triangle on the corner is a little narrower than the total point to point. There's a little extra facet sort of folding over the edge on one or two of the corner pieces. So we'll see. It shouldn't have any impact on me on the creation of the state of the setting, but it may when we get to setting it that I have to be a little more cautious at the corners. Okay, so we have our short measurement, short, our corner measurement rather, our short end measurement and our long measurement. Make sure that's tightened down. And I'm gonna start with, I'm using 24 gauge strip. And it does not need to be um, super high because I, I left myself plenty of room beneath. I may have to get my wax out of the way so I can see just how much plenty is. I left myself less than plenty, but enough. So my stone just is going to rest right below the edges. And I still have to remember the right corners. Yep, the right corners. And then the interior line, I want to come up to become the resting spot for it. So I'm going to go with, of course, I already measured my short corner when I need my dividers to get my width. I'm gonna go with giving myself just a little bit of lip for the stone to sit on. I don't wanna go too short because then I will um, hang over the, bo the bottom of the piece. And after all this work, that would be unfortunate. So I'm going to make my this is going to be a long enough strip. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Have my handy dandy little strip. Yeah, I like to use the shears on the lighter weight. As you guys know, I am a lazy, lazy jeweler and can't saw a straight line clean enough to make this worth doing. So I'm going to get my clean lines by cutting by shear with shears. You can do what works for you. And I'm going to be blackening the whole thing because I find that the score marks um, show up a little better when I'm scoring them into the blackened area. Pen is dying its final death, I think, though. <laughs> you didn't know putting your um, Sharpie markers in a little bit of rubbing alcohol will sometimes give them a little extra life. Yeah, there we go. Now I gotta let it dry. All right, so once that dries, I'm going to start marking it up. Oh, I got to go back and remeasure with my dividers to get back to my short end. Okay, so what we are going to do is follow John's guidance on starting partway through the life cycle. Um, so as a reminder, if you're if you did not correct your book with the with the images on page 71, the image three, the B and C notations are reversed, right? In order for those to match what you see in images four and six, you need to make sure that you swap B and C on image three. 
And so we are going to start with a section B, marking it in, and B is our um, medium side, our, our short side, short of the, of the two sides, and then there's the corner, which is shorter. So I'm going to use my shortest marking, check that I'm actually square, since that helps good square. We'll On the start. inside bezel, um, what's are you making the width the same width as the outside bezel? You mean the height? Yeah, the height. No, I'm making it sh just short enough below that that I can rest the stone just inside, mm -hmm. and not so short that it would be hanging its rear end out the bottom of the setting which is more dependent on me having made this tall enough to begin with to let me do that. Mm -hmm. And we'll get a chance to check that um, and we can correct from it. So if, so this one's close, this one is very close to being too short for my stone at the height that I need it. But before I solder it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the stone once I've got my, my wall in there. And as a worst case, I can push the interior bezel so it sticks out a little bit, a little lower, and give myself something. I'll just I'll just grind it down or file it down at the end. So you can correct even before you finish that. So our goal really is to get a tight fit before we go any further. Um, and yes, it'll be just a little bit shorter than the rest of the of the existing outer bezel. So um, I did say I was square on that end. Make sure, yes. Yes, I'm nice and square on that end. So I'm gonna do my B mark first. And we are doing a light touch saw mark. Um, and I saw that Wendy joined us. Wendy, just to catch you up, we are uh, moving away a bit from John's approach. Um, when I got done and was cleaning up last session's setting, I realized that I was not pleased with the lack of precision in it. And I find that I really just am having an easier time of it on uh, in my method, which is to do one corner, size it, to do another corner to size it um, and get it all set as a, as a batch before moving on. So that's what I'm doing for this inner one. And as a reminder, we just do an initial saw mark to get uh, someplace to grip as we are putting in the corner. <laughs> <clears throat> Got to go from both sides, which is a little tricky on the first one. Give myself a way to grip this better. And we're going about two thirds of the way through, just like we did on the outer one. And this is our inner fold line that we're working. So we're gonna crease across it. And I'm blanking on whether we actually do any work with the filing on these. He's just using the saw. We're not really filing on this one. Okay, and then once we've gotten our way through it, where are my parallel jaw pliers? Parallel jaw pliers have disappeared on me. Give me a moment. Ooh, nope, they're hiding in my regular pliers. Uh, as a reminder on parallel jaw plier use, when you're doing a fold, you are not torquing the tool. You're pushing the material up. The tool is a device for holding, not a device for the actual fold. And of course, I don't actually need to go all the way across. I'm just going to get to my angle to get to my next corner, and that is too steep. So I'm now at a good angle, and I've got my first short end, from the end that I've got marked though, got my first short end, and I'm about to do my first corner, which I've got in my calipers. So what I'm doing in making these marks the way that I'm doing them instead of the way that John does them is I'm now tucking my divider into the fold that I've just worked. 
and scoring the amount that I measured out before I started. And I'm gonna check that that is in fact gonna line up with my expectations for that corner. And I think it's gonna be a little snug. I'm gonna like do a tiny scooch wider than that. Just a little under, undercutting. And then because remember when we do a fold, it takes away some of that space. So you really need to check it. But then we're gonna go back and saw score it again. Going from both sides, same as we did before. Trying to keep a straight line. Just right down that score mark, which for some reason is being challenging today. Right down this little mark. There we go. Come on. It's a huge dropping things day for me today. I kept flinging the other um, setting that I was getting ready. While I was polishing, while I was sanding. Some days it's just like it wants to run away. Um, all right, so I've got another um, two thirds of the way through and I'm gonna fold to my material again, remembering that I'm not doing a full 45, but it should be, um, excuse me, a full 90, but it should be pretty close to 90 from the first angle if these were just squared up. I'm gonna check my fit again. And that is looking good on the corner fit. And now we're going to measure a little bit more of an angle. Make sure you're keeping your material as straight as you can. I've got a little bit of a torque in the material right now. Straightening that out before I take another um, hold is probably going to make it a little easier. Maybe that's with a hammer or with your pliers. I'm going to do a little bit of each. get a little more control over that. All right, so we are now at our first long side. So we're gonna be doing this length here. And I have that set with my large calipers. And this is gonna be a little trickier. I'm gonna to have to mark it because my calipers won't get into the fold. I can at least Put the indicator mark down. And I'll use my square to get into that space. This is the, with an emerald cut, it gets harder and harder with each fold you take to get your marks in place. Got my score line, but again, before I even start to use the saw, I'm going to check again to make sure that that corner feels like it's going to fold right where I want it to. It does. So I am going to do my saw scoring again. So that feels a little off square when I'm looking at it. Let me double check the back. Nope. A quirk of the light. Once again, we're flipping so that we get a more even score mark up and down. Now it's the super little things like that that are hard to come by in your early class days when somebody goes, yeah, by the way, you know, we saw unevenly. So make sure you flip your piece in mid, mid saw. Um, and then you sort of go, oh, that's why I'm always wobbly. That's why my folds aren't clean. You could also do this. There's a tool called a scorper, which is used by people doing engravings for printmaking and so on. Um, and you could absolutely, once you make your initial score line, use a scorper. It's a super sharp um, tool that gets just goes and peels away a strip right out of the middle. So once again, I'm checking my corner dots. There's my corner dot. 
making sure my angle is on its correct path. And at this point, I'm also going to see how we're doing. Oh, I'm except I'm going to the outside of my stone. I'm an idiot. I needed to be the under of my stone. That's why I shouldn't have resized that corner when I did. This is going to be too big. Too big is my guess. I'm making another lovely exterior is what it comes down to. Yep. Oh my gosh, guys. I'm going to wake up today. So we are going to have to cut the first two turns we took. And then I can trim away from there. So what I'm looking for, ah, be a little shorter on that corner. So what I'm looking for is a smidge smaller, sized up, working as if I was doing the outside. That's the part that was confusing me because I'm like, it almost feels like you're duplicating. What I you was, did. I was, I was talking at you guys and not paying enough attention that I was doing the exterior. I was absolutely duplicating what we did last time, only faster. Okay, Which, so the moral of the story you, is slow the fuck down. <laughs> how do you get it? How do you get it smaller if you keep on measuring the stone? So I, I'm measuring the stone and I just took my uh, calipers because I, I don't know if you remember, but when I was doing the short edge, I, I said, oh, that's not quite big enough. It was because it wasn't quite big enough. It was the size it needed to be to go under. So I've just measured to get that point again. And I'm going to the actual size instead of to the widened size that I did. Um, so that so you're, I, a you're a little bit below the girdle. I'm actually, what I'm actually doing is holding it at the girdle to make sure that I'm hitting point to point. So I'm holding it like this, just so I can see that I'm really point to point, because then when my fold tightens it in a little bit, it's going to rest just under that. When in doubt, check where your stone is going to sit. I was checking the wrong way is what it comes down to. I was checking as if I was doing an exterior and I should be checking as if I'm doing a resting on top. See that? So I was checking this way, which is what we do for the outside one. Mm -hmm. And I should have been checking for, is it just fitting right under, under. before I did my cuts? That is so tough. That's where I'm stuck with mine. Okay. So and tell me what you mean by you're stuck with it. Is getting the well, right... How much smaller do you make it? You know, is it the width of the material? And it's not on the inside one. The answer is enough. The way that John would put it, <laughs> enough. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> I know I'm passing on the John wisdom. But what that translates to me is if I, if once I've folded it, it is hitting. Let me draw this because it's not, you're not going to be able to see it on my tiny facets. Yeah, this is one of those, he would do that occasionally, where he'd be like, well, like, well John, how much am I, what, what proportions? Well, John doesn't do the math route either, which may be why I loved him so much when he was teaching these. Um, but uh, the, the, the answer is, ultimately, it is about enough, because any given stone may have some things that impact it. So this is what we're working with right now. I'm going to try and give us a little semi-dimensional view of our girdle there, which we don't really see much of that, right? And then it goes back there, back there, back there, right? And then we got our facets coming up, blah, blah, blah. We got our center facet, depending on the shape of your faceting, right? And so our outer one is pretty straightforward. Our outer one is we want it to fold here and fold here so that the material that we have sort of cups it, right? Wraps around it, basically. So it's going to come beyond just enough that it has a lip hanging over, which is what we need to hold it in place. But our inside one, the outer wall of it is going to run. Let's see if I have a third color. The outer wall of it has to be just at these corners because that's where it will solder to this inner wall. And then if we could see inside, what we'd be getting is this step thing that it's resting on, right? So if, if my front wall wasn't there, it would be resting corner to corner, 
right on top of it, which is why I'm doing that measurement of the corner to corner, knowing that as soon as I do a fold, it tightens that in a little bit. So I never want to be wider than my stone shape. And then the challenge is that it has to not only do that, but it also has to then fit snugly whatever we built for that outer frame so that we can solder it into place, right? And that's the, whether we're doing an, the misery that is a, an octagonal piece, you know, that is an emerald cut, or we're doing it on, it, it, same thing applies when we do a single point on say a teardrop, right? We still have to get a snug fit of our underlying thing so that it is what, what the stone is resting on. And I can tell you that if it's easier for you to do your inner one and then build the outer to it, it may that may be what's the approach that you want to use. Some people, they can do a resting one because they can see it resting where they want it to rest. And then the tougher part is to make the outer one that fits that snugly, right? I personally find it's easier to do the outer because that's the more meticulous one. I can fake the inside if I need to stretch it a little bit but I can't fake the outside. The outside has to be a perfect fit. So that's why outer first, then inner. And it's also part of the reason I don't do those strips that he that he gives us as a variant on this, because there's no coming back once you've cut a wrong size when the two pieces are already soldered together. Right? I don't, did that drawing help at all? Is that visually? Yes, just, just show me. I mean, I, I understand that. Where would you measure doing the outer better with that picture? The with top of that? Picture? So with this picture, I would follow John's measuring guidance, which is that we're going to continue. I need a color that you haven't seen yet. Um, we're going to continue beyond. I really, where are my other colors? There we go. So if this is our um, corner, we're going to continue on at that angle, which means it's the width of the stone plus this slice of pie okay right, for the outer edge because then what we're doing is the body plus the extra little slice of pie on each corner and that is that when we get the fold we get the the fold that the fold folds in because we've cut away material at the pie and so it collapses the the v that is the cut we've done so that it pinches together to the width that we got. I hope that made God. some kind of sense. Um, and again, I find that I can do better jobs of correcting doing a slice, a slice, a slice, a slice, rather than what John has drawn in the book of measure them all out. Because if I've measured them all out and I screw up one, it just multiplies as I move down the chain, right? Questions on that before I go back to trying to correct and make my under piece, not my over piece. Mm. Thank you. Sure. Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. So where did that leave me? That was my corner before. And now that is my long side. And all right. So I'm going for the under and I've got my score mark and it looks like it's in a good spot to be under. When in doubt, make it smaller than you think, but not by a lot, because you can stretch it. But corners in particular are a little challenging to stretch. Also, I recommend you start by working with a big stone. When you do these smaller scale, they get nightmarish to go to the corners. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> oh, I told you that on the last time, too. I'm just repeating. You but did. Yeah. Well calibrated and big is the way to start working emeralds. Or, you know, just avoid them. But they're so pretty. Okay, now, second time. Let's see how this does for an undercut. Again, we're not going for a full 45. We're going for the differential. And this time, I'm going to get smart and rest my stone on top of it and see how we're doing. So that's going to be, I think, a good resting spot. And probably because I left my length as long as I did on the long side, probably going to have to do a little filing when we get back to that first corner. But I'm happier about that. 
And now I'm going to, because I'm paranoid, I'm going to check all my measurements now. My middle may still be a smidge wide. I need air on the side of slightly smaller. So once again, it's what would it be if I'm resting corner to corner? Yeah, I need this a little smaller. Question? I start. I heard somebody start to talk. Okay. Once again, it's a little hard to get this in, so I'm going to do the mark and use my square. Might as well use all the tools today. As I mentioned, by doing this method, instead of the full mapping, I have opportunities to check. I have an opportunity to check that I'm going to be where I think I need to be before I've done my sawing in. Um, and then I have a second opportunity before I make the fold, just to make sure. So, oops, not inside, on top, on top. Yeah, that's still a little wider than I want it to be, I think. So I can also sort of spot check. That's going to be pretty good. Yeah, but I need, I definitely need to take it, my, my medium, my middle side in a tiny bit further than I have those calibers. Point oh two millimeter. When I do a second score, I like to relive my theater days and scratch out the mark that I don't want to hit to help as a reminder. Just put little score lines diagonally across the one that you don't want um, to make sure that you're clear on which one you do want. It's a little scratch up that you're going to have to clean up later, but it makes sure you're not spacing out and choosing the wrong one. Okay, once again, with the corner being bent, I'm just pushing against it, using the pliers to hold. And let's see whether the magic is gonna let it rest where we want it to rest. Too steep on my angles. There we go. And that looks like that's gonna be nice and supportive. And get fully in there, but I can see that I'm going to go corner to corner. So what I'm checking is, am I not too large going corner to corner here when I've got this stuffed inside? And the answer is I am not. I may have to do a tiny bit of stretching in order to get it a snug fit. Uh, but I, again, I'd rather err on the side of caution. Okay, so once again, we're going with the narrower version of the corner. And... I'm going to use the existing cut mark. Oops, I feel I'm not doing a good job of following it. Make our score. Before I do any sawing, I'm going to check that it looks like I am going to sit resting right at that corner. It does cut.
if you're having a hard time keeping these lines straight, no shame in um, just picking up the saw every downstroke and only doing one little stroke at a time to get you where you need to go. Depends on what level of control you have with that blade. So I'm seeing a little bit of a torque to my piece and I'm trying to correct it before it gets worse. I also should be able to see that I'm starting to get fairly close to what I need to fit. I'm just going to my corner. I'm going to have to do a little bit of stretching in the corner, which is going to be a challenge. Corners are tough, but it's doable. I'm not too far off. All right, and check that I'm resting on top as expected. And I am. Good, good. Okay, we're progressing to our next long side. And since I, uh, I didn't get the right length on that one before, I'm going to, again, double check my numbers before I go further. And yes, in fact, I'm going to take it down a smidge. Um, actually, you could also, if you're really good, you could also measure using that inner check by going corner to corner to see what your outer light layer is going to be. So I'm using these on the outside. I'm curious as to how close that comes. Yeah, that's right about where I was. I want to go a tiny bit smaller, give myself room to... Oh, not that much smaller, though. No. To stretch if I need to. Okay, and then the square to get a straight line from the mark point. To lose sight of the mark I just made. And before I cut, I'm going to check and see whether I will rest still where I want to be resting. If I make that cut, looks like I will be. I'm ready to saw. Two thirds of the way through, give or take. Easier to do. Oops, I went too far on the 26 gauge interior than on that outer 22 that we used. Using the fulcrum effect, getting that slight angle. <clears throat> Checking whether we're still sitting on top of our piece. A little bit of push in, corner squared up. I think we're going to be in decent shape. It's, it's a little bit more bend in it still. I'm going to actually do a little correction on the sawing because it's I, it looks like I didn't saw evenly down my little line, so it's giving me a little grief in the middle of the fold. You can always use the saw as a tiny little file to get a little further down. And then, yeah, there we go. Now I've got a crisp corner. And you're using a two? Uh, I'm using a two aught, two zero. That's my sort of go to for anything in the 24 to 22 range, sometimes heavier, sometimes lighter. It's too steep of an angle. Go. A little bit more angle. When you get down towards the end of this stuff, do very, very gentle adjustments because it really is unpleasant to have it crash out on you. So I'm going to um, zoom in for a second and see if I can show you how we're faring. 
on this fit marker dot. So what we're getting to is that it is resting seated down on top of that piece, right? So it's not sitting in like I started. And in theory, as we go, we should be seeing a closer and closer snug fit into this piece, which we are. We don't have anything big hanging over. We're gonna have to do a little sharpening of this corner probably because the fold isn't crisp enough, but we're getting there. Let's keep yeah. it up. All right, next we got a short corner again. It. The other corner as a marker. I think if I had my preference, if I had three really good pairs of dividers, I would use dividers over the electronic calipers because they're a little easier to use as scoring tools. Let's make sure that fits where I want it. So what I'm doing is making sure that my the sparkle of where I've scored it is showing up basically resting under the point at the coulette. Sorry, at the, uh, uh, yeah, at the coulette. No, the coulette is the point. Uh, man, where'd my words go? The edge, what's the edge? Somebody give me the word. Girdle. Say again. Girdle. The girdle, thank you. Man, I won't wear one, but I should be able to remember it because it wraps around the stone. Yes, I want to be, um, I want my sparkly line to show up just at the corner right below the girdle if I've got it trimmed nicely. And again, these get harder and harder to get in there to cut, so be careful. Um, many is the time that my last cut I've managed to knock the others out of whack by, you know, they're too bent, too foldy. Um, and if you are, if you're finding that you're having real trouble keeping them positioned, it is okay to go do all of those corner solders that John describes. Remember in his method, each fold that you make, you're doing a solder after the fold. And I am playing with fire or not playing with fire and risking not doing that until I've gotten the whole set. Okay, dun, 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 where my sliders again? And you we're gonna run into, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> you said you would rather have three good pair of dividers rather than three calipers. For this exercise. How yes. do you, do, you know, I have a range of dividers and I have my steret, you know, which are really good, but how do you determine a good pair? So I thought these were Starrett's, but I'm looking at them and they're a company called uh, Goodell Pratt. I must have a piece of Starrett's pair around because that's the go-to. Um, I look for one that has enough material at the ends that it doesn't get banged up and bent, that you can actually, it can be sharp enough that you can actually get a good pinch with it. And it still has material that you can have sharp enough to score with. Um, and I like one that is a little hard to open and close. Um, because I want it to hold position. Uh, and I want it to have heft. I don't know why, but like, I don't, I want a good heft of steel on these. I think I over folded on this. So I got to do a little correction. I'm going to start using smaller little pliers to get the little movements. Definitely not squared up right now. Tiny, tiny, gentle adjustments. Make sure that we're still resting when we need to rest. We are starting to make a little platform and check that we are still likely to fit in there. We are. Okay, we do our final 
bend here, which is my medium. I also find that my best tools for things like that are found at really good junk stores. So I feel confident that the dividers that I have are all, um, dividers and tools of that ilk are all, um, have been used by many craftspeople before me. Um, measure that twice because that one I'm not sure I made my mark clean enough. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast, and if you're scrounging for nice dividers or other similar hand tools, take a trip up to Liberty, Maine, and go spend a very long time scrounging around the incredibly musty, cavernous Liberty tools in Liberty, Maine. It's going to be the last of the three stores there that are closing down the other two, or they've closed down at least one of them, and the other one is in the process of closing down. But they're keeping the, the main store open. I'm just checking once again that I think my corner, I think my corner in this case may be a little wide, so I may be over-measured. Oh, nope, I'm just at a bad angle on the corner. Nope, I'm way over measured on this one. How did I get so much bigger than I need to be here? Must have moved my settings. Take that measurement again. Yeah, I got a little bit wider, so I must have loosened up a little bit. Watch out that last mark. The black M2 to make that a little easier to see. That pen though. Good. Really refreshed pen. Not feeling good about this measurement. Check a couple more times. Maybe overthinking this one, gang. Almost exactly where I had it before.
this gets harder and harder to position because you can't really see past all the crease, all the folds. I think we're in good shape. There we go. Crossing my fingers. Wax. I'm back. It always feels so weird the few times in remaking that you're not doing the sawing way we all learned, which is the vertical, the perfectly vertical. So I feel like I'm doing something dirty when I'm filing flat on. to get a little sharper crease in the previous corner. So I'm not sure I'll be able to get it small focused enough on screen, but when I say I need to do a little touch up, let's see, let's see if I can show you this. Nope, in, in, in. Focus for me. I don't know. So when I say that I need to do a little touch up to the crease, can you guys see on screen that there's a slight bulge right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It means that I didn't file cleanly enough on the inside to get an even cut all the way up. I mean, that's the reason we flip, but look how much crisper this one is. Oop, I'm out of screen, out of screen. See how nice and crisp that one is? This one. I didn't get my center uh, sawed down. So again, I'm just gonna sneak back in there with the saw. Let's see if I can do that now. I gotta zoom back out for you guys to be able to see this. So what see. would happen if you didn't crisp that out? If I didn't, I would, so it's what it's doing is it's torquing um, the, it's twisting a little bit on that spot. So it doesn't want to meet up nicely. I'm, uh, nicely, I'm going to exaggerate what it's causing to happen. It's causing this side to travel down at an angle. Yeah. And it also, so it also is going to make it much harder to fit into the tight corner that I've got on the outer line. So I'm just going in and doing some down strokes into that corner, being real careful not to cut through. And then I'm going to take a small pair of pliers. I may actually have to go and get my mini ones from Michael's. I need the minis because that corner, I need to hold on to. Oh, those aren't even small enough. And I got to go to my, which pliers do I have that'll do the trick for this? Elf pliers. Pardon? Elf pliers. Elf pliers, yes. I need some elf pliers. So I just need something that I can hold in between on the little curve while I also can hold the crease point to tighten it up a little bit. And I'm just doing a few little squeezes to try and get that spot a little corrected. So I'm squeezing in a little gentle bend at the same time. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was a moment ago, just to get that cleaned up a smidge. Um, and what that does is give me a little bit more guarantee that I'm going to get it into the corner. I've got another one over this side that I'm going to take care of while I'm doing them before I finalize squaring everything up. On the outside one, you can get away with a little bit of this because you can file the corner so that it looks from the exterior like it's in good shape but it does make your interior fit a little more challenging. Yep. Squeeze. Try and crisp that up. Could have caught it a little sooner, but 
and correct it when you have. So now gives me a little bit more awareness into my final edge, which in theory is just another corner that I can mark and measure. And then I'm just gonna have to get the angles a little bit cleaned up, but I left a little overhang from when we had to start the corrective action going back before. So once again, using my dividers, giving myself that final mark. And on this one, I'm gonna actually cut it with shears to snip off the excess, giving myself a little bit of overlap just so it's, I'm getting that extra out of the way. I've got all this like three quarters of an inch extra. And by clearing the excess out, I can then get in there and cut the angle that I want with my saw a little bit better. But I can also do a double check that my mark is where I'm gonna land when I solder these together. So I can line up. So what I've done is I've lined up the very first side that we were having with my mark. And I wanna see how we're doing or resting on top, looking good. Go in any, I don't think so. I'm also gonna do another thing. I'm gonna check that I'm relatively square on my long sides, and that's where I see I may need to bend a little bit more. Because if I squared up my outer one, I need my inner one squared up nicely too. So when you get a chance, Rachel, um, yep. put this stone on it and let, and show us. So what you're, what I'm looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Do, do, do. I may have to hold it up to show you, but I can't get right over the top. But what I'm doing is I'm checking, is my vertical wall square to my short wall? Well, I meant when you have the stone on it. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep. So let me get it back to where the mark is. Is that showing well enough? How it just rests? Yeah, gives you an uh -huh. idea of how much, yeah. Yeah, it looks, yeah, it looks good. So, and the magic is, will it fit in here once we're done with it, which it should. Let's make sure that we aren't doing anything shy of what we need. No, we're going to be in good shape. I think I'm going to have to stretch smidge amounts, but I think I'm also ready to cut this final piece off and then do a little filing. So um, when Alan Revere was on early on, he reminded me that sometimes you cut from the inside, which is what I'm going to do once I get this started, I'm probably going to cut upright after I get the initial cut marks in. I got to get in there to do it, though. And it's all closely fitted, so this is a little snug. And can we see that, Rachel? Oh, am I zoomed? I'm zoomed in too far. Sorry. Sorry. So I've just got it strong as if it was cutting out the center of a poliform or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just start my cut um, on the horizontal path before I then lift it up to actually cut the rest of the way through. Come on. A little wax. This is catching. So unlike in all the other score marks, in this case, I'm aiming to cut through. So I'm just starting enough of a cut that I have something to follow through with. And then I'm going to angle it a little bit outward to try and get something that's going to be flush to the, the cut of the material that's coming in from the long edge. So I'm not cutting outward directly. I'm not cutting... Um, perpendicular to the metal I'm cutting at that slight angle. 
really hard to see you. Use or of pliers to get that last little bit out of the way. All right, so now I've got my final edge, but we need to remember two things. One, it's a little bit sloppy, so I need to clean it up. And two, this, this side is still probably a smidge long because it was the extra from when I did it wrong at the beginning. And I can see that in the distortion that I'm getting in the, in the form. So I'm not getting a good square on one side, but I am on the other. No, I'm not even there. There we go. I'm pretty square there. And when I go to the other, So now we're at the careful filing, but I think what I'm going to do before we get to the heavy duty filing now is the point at which I want to put, I, I'm confident about all these corners that we folded. So I want to get solder into all of those to strengthen them. And then we'll work on that final seam. So I'm going to hop over to the bench. And use some hard solder. Am I showing the right? Yes, I am showing the right camera to you guys. Luxing it all up, the huge. Just remembering to not put any solder on my final seam. And I'm just putting a little bit of solder in each corner, right up at the top, and then I'm going to get it to flow down into the, the saw, saw marks that we've used to crease. Run it down the inside of each seam. If you need to, you can flip it over and add some more. It doesn't want to flow all the way down. If you don't need a ton, you're just trying to fill in the saw marks. That definitely needs a little flip. I've got a couple that didn't flow all the way. Pretty good. It got pretty filthy, so I'm going to put it in a pickle for a moment and pause before we put that final trim in. Any questions while we wait for that to pickle? Have you soldered the other one yet? The, the outer first one? Outer frame? The first one? Do you mean the outside frame? Yes. Yeah, that's fully done. Okay. Yeah. 
that we did. So we did it last time. I redid it after that with the new approach that I wanted to be doing. Right. Um, so Cause I. You did what? it the same way, right? You did, you did all this, you did all the filing and shaping. And then at the end you soldered it. Uh, this one that I redid my way instead of John's way. Yes, I yes. did it the way I'm doing the one you're seeing me do today. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I just find I get better precision than I was on his approach. I just was not happy with my end product. Um, and I remember from the last time that was my frustration as well when he did the, the setting the first time. Um, my question, Rachel, is that on that inner bezel, you soldered, you know, all of the corners and then you yep. flipped it to see if it was drawn all the way through. And my thinking was, as you were doing that is why is she, why is she adding more solder when you're going to solder those two inner and outer together using solder around the end? It seems like it would be too much solder. So I'm using very tiny little chip solder on this. And if you think about it, that interior line that I'm filling with the solder is actually going to be the inside of the bezel. It's not the side that's going to be soldered to the inner ring, right? We're, we're on the interior that we're yeah. putting our solder, right? Yeah. So we, we want a good solid flow of everything so that it looks like a clean wall instead of showing the saw marks. So overkill by a little bit because then we're just going to file our corners clean, right? Um, so when you solder the two together, the inner and the back, where yeah. are you putting that solder? Are you putting it on the bottom of those two bezels or are you so, push, placing it on the inside of? I shell? like to work from the upside down, from the back yeah. side of it, yeah. Um, and okay. then I'll sometimes add touch up to the top edge, uh, to the top lip of the step right okay. in here, which... We're going to do a little file down on, remember John, when we did the rounds right. of the ovals, we were doing that little file down, which lets the solder for, sort of fill it instead of creating uh, a, an extra lump at the top. So you flood your solder from the back and it should be enough to flow until it meets and creates a nice step for things to rest on. But that's between the outside of what we're working on now and the inside of the old one. That's where they meet with the solder. Other questions? I'm gonna go over to the pickle and see if it's strong enough to have cleaned that while you ask. I gotta go. So see you next time. Okay. And um, uh, aloha to everybody. Yeah, yeah, you too. I hope things are starting to calm down. Um, and just so you know, what I'm aiming for is to finish the Cogswell project by end of year. Okay, so we got well, two more sessions after this. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see you because I'm in the class also. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Bye, Paula. Bye-bye, bye -bye, everyone. Have a good one. Okay. Any other questions before I switch back to getting us fitted? Are you using hard solder? I was using hard solder for that seam fix. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I got a little bit of lumpy stuff left over. I think I just take off of here. Can you spotlight right. yourself again, Rachel? Oh, am I not spotlighted? I'm showing spotlighted to me. Okay, let me check mine. Okay, there. Okay. Um, so I'm also at a point where I can start to see how well this will fit right now, which may guide some of my adjustments on closing things up. And it's going to be a good snug fit, I think. So... Let me see. I'm going to have to tighten some of my corners more. And do a little filing. So I've definitely got more material on the long side that we started with than I need. I'm going to take some of that down without damaging what I've done. Remind me what gauge that is. This is 26 gauge, 24 gauge, 24 gauge. Okay. Yeah, 24. Um, A little bit of room to file. Uh, so it's the filing that I'm doing is the um, 
the end, not the thickness of it. I'm trying to get some short, I'm trying to shorten this one long side by a little bit because it was the, remember I started sizing wrong. So I was doing the outer edge. So this starting line is the length of the outside, not the length of the inside, but I'm taking care of before going further. Because that's going to definitely keep me from being able to jam this in here. One way that it fits better than the others. And some of the challenges you're going to have in fitting this include, did you match your corner angles? That's going to be the biggest. Now we're starting to get in there. And then it's about cleaning up the fit at the end. So when I fold this over a little bit, I can shove the corners in, which is a good sign. Because what I'm trying to do is get all my fit clean, going into all the corners. And then I'm going to do the last adjustment by further trimming down where my seam meets to be what I want it to be. So you can see I'm pretty darn close in that fit right now. I've just got a little excess. In so do your seams meet or are they overlapped a little bit? They're overlapping right now and that's okay, okay with me because that's, I, if it were the other way, I wouldn't be able to do filing to clean it up. But what I'm going to do is get it snugged in and then I'm going to mark it where I think I need to trim it to and I'll do some careful filing to get them to, to meet up. I think I just need to take that smidgy bit off of there. And then it's pretty darn close. Do a little tiny stretching once I've got it closed up. And I'm going to actually try sheer trimming this. Get a cleaner one. So I'm sheer trimming the long piece to get a straight edge, but the one that I saw cut through on the short end, I'm doing the file in order to maintain that angle that I cut into it with my cleanup. Let's try that again, see how it's fitting. Should have marked my starting corner, but I didn't. I'm going to have to refigure it out every time. Excuse me. Now I'm going to play around with my various pliers to see about finessing the fits into the corner. And then see whether I need to take any more off. A little bit more off of my long edge. Crisp up. Are spot. you allowing for like spring back? Yeah, that's what I'm fighting is how yeah. do I get to be just the right fit? Um, and I'm ever so slightly long still on this one side. Slivers too long. And again, I didn't mark my starting point. So if you cut 
too much of a sliver, what happens? Then we're going to do a stretch, right? Once we've got it soldered together, we're going to stretch. Okay. And stretch and stretch. And I think that, pull that into the corner. I think that we're going to be where we want to be. So I am going to line those up, make sure that I am meeting the angle cleanly. And I'm going to go over and solder that last seam. Again, I'm going to try for hard solder. Be a little more generous than I was on the fill corners. What tip is that? This is a uh, one. Is this a one? Yeah, I think it's a one. Yep, it's a one. Smith one. Oh, but now that I'm clean, I can see that I didn't actually get all the way down on the interior of one of my other sides. So I'm going to add a little more solder. Come on. I'm going to fix something pops. Okay, good. We're gonna get super grubby this time. We're gonna go straight back to fitting. And dun dun dun. Now comes the did we manage to make it work? Magic part. Okay, mm -hmm. once I get this fitted, you guys are gonna remind me to mark my piece because I keep forgetting. <laughs> I remind you to switch cameras. Oh, I thought I had, sorry. There we go. So, uh, I'm going to need to crisp up the corner that um, was opposite the solder join. It's just a little less angular, angular than the other corners because that other item pulled it in, <clears throat> which means I might want to go back and saw again. I'm going to see how it fits. But I also need to take a little bit of the solder at the seam down because it's making a little gap. Just flattening that a little bit. Doesn't have to be super clean because it's going to be hidden inside by the other solder. But it's good to get it a nice fit to begin with. And how close are we? Ooh. So... We're in pretty darn good shape on this first pass. A little bit of force to get it in there. Going to have to do a little bit of pinching to the corners, but we can do our first test of, is it too tall? And it is a little too tall. So I'm going to be pulling it back out can you hold that up to show us the too tall? I'm sorry, right? That's okay. Um, let me get it in there as much as it can right now. Got to be careful with these not to force the corners in. Starting. Oh, I'm upside down. That's why. Hang on a sec. It may not be too, too tall if I push it all the way through. Yeah. 
okay, we may discover that I am snug as I need to be simply because of the directionality of this, because I'm having a hard time getting it to move through. All right, so now that I've got my starting corner, so it's ever so slightly, zoom in on this for you in just a sec, ever so slightly too high. at the edge. You can see just the tiniest bit of the girdle showing over the top. Oh, that's right? beautiful it's picture. Thank you. So wow. close. So close. Yeah. Um, so, but what I can do, because I'm not locked in yet, is I can push my uh, bezel beyond, so it's going to hang over a little bit more. I'll probably go, to be safe, I'll probably go sort of a millimeter. The only thing you have to be careful of when you're doing this kind of a correction is that you're doing it evenly so that you don't leave yourself a platform that is off kilter for the stone. And it still needs to be a super snug fit, right? So now what I've got, find the corner that's the correct one, is that my stone will rest. If I can get it in there without jamming it. I haven't cut my corner um, cutaways, so I got to be careful not to push too hard. There. Not quite tight enough. But now I can rest the stone underneath a little bit more. See how snug that fit is? So now we've got room to push down. That's beautiful, Rachel. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we haven't finished yet. We still got a little bit of work to do. Just trying <laughs> to be very cautious about pushing that a little bit. So I'm going to um, make a score mark on this where I want it to end up and get my okay, you can back. You can back out now. Oh, thank you. Yes. Please forget that part. Why doesn't it auto zoom for me? It should know what I want it to do. <laughs> so I'm going to put a, a score mark at the height that I want it to be hanging out to the bar. No, that's going to be good. All right. So, and then once I've got that measure, then I can mark it all the way around to make sure that I'm staying the same amount un uh, out hanging off the end all the way around my piece. So I'm just giving myself a guide. And this is the part that I'll file away once we solder into place. Okay, so I'm, I've am i got a snug enough fit that I am going to choose my, make sure that I know my top and I'm gonna cho choose to do the angle filing. So what I'm doing is just putting a little bevel along the top sequence, and this is the, the extra little channel that our solder can flow in. So what I then want to do is make sure my fit is so snug that that is the hard part. Like I just, that just helps me get it past the hard part of fitting. And then I'll be able to have it still snugly fit. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of stretching on my sides but not a ton because that fit was pretty close to snugged in. And of course I forgot to mark my top again. Let's see. So this is the a good tightness but it's not a perfect tightness and i'm gonna get it lined up and then show you what i mean by that so i'm probably gonna pull this even though i'm hammering it right now which is a good sign i'm gonna probably pop this out and do a couple of judicious little stretches okay let me zoom once more
You guys could play a drinking game based on how often I zoom the wrong direction. Okay, so take a peek at this fit. It's not, it's snug enough that I can't shake out, right? But I've got small gappage here, tiny gappage on one side of that one, tiny gappage in that corner. This corner is looking pretty good. So I want to do our usual little pinch technique combined with, I'm going to use my parallel draw pliers as much as possible because some of this tightness or some of this lack of tightness is that it's just not upright enough. And when I squeeze them together, I can clear out the gappage there. Make sure that I'm snug on all my long and-, and zoom, zoom out just a tad. Sorry. Thank you. So that's good. Okay. So what I'm doing first is the squeezing of the set with parallel jaw pliers, right? Which is easy to do on my long sides in this because I can get in there. It doesn't help me with my corners, but what it does is set the square of the piece as much as possible. So now I know when I'm tucking my corners in that I'm truly tucking them into position. And then if I have pliers that are the right size to encourage the corners. I can do a little bit of squeezing there too, but I may have to do a little bit of a stretch. It looks like this short side needs to be squeezed a little bit wider this way in order to get a truly good fit in that corner. The other end is looking pretty nice. And I'm gonna remember to mark my matched corners this time. So I need to squeeze a smidge along this line to push this corner. See how it's sort of tilted a little bit? It's not hitting the corner corner. I need to squeeze this wider so that it tucks better into that corner. Now I'm going to go back and use, I happen to have a nice parallel jaw pair of round pliers, which is a lovely addition, a little hard to find. Most people just see the... Um, straight parallels, but this means I've got a nice clean squeeze mark up and down my piece. And again, this is going to be hidden away behind solder and stuff, and then we'll sand the interior. So I'm just going to do a set of three matched squeezes, and I'm squeezing from both top and bottom to make sure that it stretches equally. And then finding my corner and it should be even harder to, to fit in this time. It is, it's nice, we're getting close. I think I need to angle the problem corner a little bit better. So I'm gonna try and tuck in and frame that up a little. So it is the, it's the corner not quite being at the same angle as the other corners that's causing the issue. But I've got a little tiny bit of solder that may be interfering. Right up at the top there. Two corners in from the back. Again, I've got my beveled edge going down into the outer frame first, and it should be getting harder and harder to fit, which it is. That one end that I'm super happy with and this one smushy little corner, not quite stretched far enough. I'm gonna peel it back out. And I'm gonna keep doing this back and forth until it is tight enough that, um, it's hard to pull back out. I've just got to remember not to tap it beyond the score mark I made so that I'm not going too deeply into the frame because then I'll be fighting to get it back out. Okay. 75th time is the charm. Bevel side down into the depths of the outer frame. Oh, that's going to be much nicer. Oh, 
are. No, just the belly weight. Okay, I'm much happier with this. I think I can probably get a squidge more. That's a nice, highly technical term into the corner. Let me see if I need to just do plier squeezes or if I need to actually size it more. We just need the plier squeezes. Tiny, tiny amounts of gap you can fill with solder, but they're tinier amounts than you think. Yeah, I still need a little more stretch on that side, that short side that I've been working on. <clears throat> How are you not destroying that outside bezel? Uh, so I'm the outside bezel, the only thing I'm doing is flat pliers against it. Okay. Inside bezel is what I'm squeezing and okay. sizing. So I'm I'm marking the heck out of this one end that I'm resizing. Um, and again, we're gonna um, sand the interior, and the exterior of this is going to be hidden inside of a layer of solder. So all I'm doing is the squeeze. And you don't have to kneel it. Um, I'm trying to avoid doing that because I've got it so nicely fitted everywhere else that I don't want to unsquare and warp it. Um, and we had just before I started doing all this, we had it under the torch. So it's not terrible. Like I'm making these marks pretty readily. It's just a matter of getting it crisp enough to the edges. But if you needed to, absolutely go ahead and anneal. All right, now we're really snugging in. Fine. Tiny caps. And checking to flush everything up. So I can see a tiny bit of light through that corner that was giving me trouble, but not enough to concern me. So I'm gonna zoom in and show you how snug we're looking on the inside. And then I'll show you what the stone will set looking like or what the stone hanging out in this will look like. Focus. There we go. So see how closely fitted that is all the way around on the inside yes that's really from the good. back you can see tiny gapping on this one corner a little bit right there but that's going to flow that's going to be small enough that the solder is going to hit and you can see i've got it marked to my line make sure i've got it actually marked to my line though It there. Now we want to see what is it going to do with the stone in place. Is the stone going to be low enough? If not, we can correct before we solder. Come on, little guy. Sit flat like you're supposed to. It will be all set. Come on. Yeah, the corner, I'm a little concerned not to not to force it. But we're going to roughly, I got to push this corner down, but I don't want to do that until we're in place. But we're going to have good enough room that we'll have material to push down. You can get a fingernail in there, basically, to catch it. So let's do one more confirmation that we are equal all the way around on our line. We are... So what I'm doing is checking, it's scored in so you guys can't really see it, but I'm checking to make sure that I've actually bumped up and out to that line. And now we're gonna pop on over and try the magic final solder. 
John might have us do this with hard solder. I will be doing it with medium solder. He wouldn't strongly object, I think, to using medium solder. We just don't want to go with easy because we need something left to set it, I mean, excuse me, to attach it to our work. I'm gonna do a fair amount of heat on this. I just wanna do that. Oops, my jar is jammed. Not gonna happen today. And so um, our mission is to get solder flowing all the way around this inside loop. And I'm going to be using wire solder for this because I can rest the big pieces there. I might touch up a little bit with um, chip solder if I find little spots that I want to do more on. Um, but for now, what I want is some decently sized pieces that I can rest on that lip that's created between the two layers. Number one tip, coming out fairly hot because we need to heat through the two layers. Oh, decent. And I'm going to tweeze my pieces into place because I want to just rest them. I may even do a little dip in my flux to get them to stick. These tweezers are not going to help though, which my small tweezers. Yeah, I cleaned up earlier and then cleaned everything away that I shouldn't have. Uh, let me find another pair. Our gang, bear with me. My tiny tweezers are too tiny. I must have dropped a pair. Where are my good tweezers? What have I been doing that I needed tweezers for other than at that bench? Uh, blah, blah, blah. No, I guess I'll start in a new pair. Other good tweezers. <laughs> the mystery of the missing tweezers. Let me see if I have. There of this sort that I like. Yes, I know what's going on in my Rio Grande shopping list. Okay, I'm making do with what I got. The big clumsy tweezers instead. So I'm being pretty darn generous with this because it needs to not only flow at this end of things, but I want it to fill and flow all the way through to that section that we filed down before we shoved it into the interior line. So I could have put a good sized chunk on each. And I'm gonna try and get good temperature all the way through and get it really flowing down into the seams. I should see a lot of silver line and I definitely need more than I've got already. I'm gonna add some to the corners as well. At this point, I just need to control it a little more than those tweezers are letting me. Rachel, how are you heating it so it doesn't flow down on the outside of that outside bezel? Good question. It's a combination of heating the inside and heating the outside sort of equally. Just remembering that when we have a little frame like this, it becomes a kind of convection of an inside. So you have to sort of move your heat in and out or else you'll way overheat the interiors. Similar to when we do hollow form work, we want to sort of be aware that it becomes its own reflective little oven. 
And also it helps that we're using 26 gauge on the inside and 22 gauge on the outside. And there, you now jinxed it. You, you jinxed me. I got soldered down the side. Um, but we'll clean it up with sanding and fire. <laughs> not a huge deal. Um, I'm just at this point focused on can I get enough fill that I'll be able to solder down the way that I want. So a combination of interior and exterior to balance that heat. And moving, moving, moving. There we go. Now I'm seeing some flow where I want to see it. I'm seeing good long flow, long wall flow. My corners could use a little more flow. And as a, if you need it, you can always flip it over and draw the solder up from the inside on the other side as well, which I'm going to get to shortly once I get a little more flow in these corners. Because um, what I want to see is that I have a, a solder flow line on the inside edge as well. And now I'm going to start using slightly smaller bits of it because I don't want a lot flowing down the walls. And it's more likely to flow down the interior wall. So I'm just doing some touch-ups where I'm seeing it not truly flowing all the way around. Small little bits here and there. I'll try and finish filling in, but not too much because this can really, otherwise you're going to have a lot of cleanup, which you can do. It's just a pain in the butt with, um, you'll have to take some drill bits to, you know, burrs to it and get the little blobs that you've left in the corners, which we're going to have to do on the corners a little bit anyhow. All right. So my interior is looking pretty darn good at this point. Good flow. Just make sure that I've got it everywhere that I think I need from the back side. A little bit more there. So it's a surprising amount of solder to get this filled in where you want it. And if you're not getting it all in your first pass, that's okay. Go pickle it and rinse it really thoroughly because you got tiny gaps and you don't want your pickle filling in those gaps. Um, and then come back and do a little more flow once it's clean. Rachel? Yeah? Um, uh, to me, you haven't used a whole lot of flux. Uh, should... Yeah, I, I could put flux on here to clean it up a little bit. Uh, I did I did coat the whole thing when I started. Yeah, you uh, sprayed it. I didn't spray it because my spray is jammed, so I was just using the uh, liquid paste flux. Oh, okay. Um, but I'm getting grubby enough that if I'm going to do more on this, I'll probably pickle um, and then re-coat because um, I've got a couple places where it doesn't want to flow into the corners exactly. Um, so this is a solidly soldered piece. It's just not a solid enough to to make the seam lines go away. So I'm going to give it a moment because we kept it pretty hot and then I'll quench it and I'll toss it in the pickle. And I will sometimes actually do my grind down before I do the next pass of soldering because sometimes it just appears to be gapping and really it's just the nature of having some of that extra material sticking out. Um, so I've got, I potentially have better solder job than I think I have just looking at it while it's all grubby and, and layered so that I can't really see where it's flowing. Questions while we clean that up in a pickle? Your call, whether you're going to find an easier time of it doing this piece at a time model, you know, step at a time model or John's, um, and whether it's easier for you to do the interior first and then the outer or the outer and then the inner. It's my personal choice is outer first and then uh, and doing in this piecemeal. It's, I mean, you can see how much faster this inner one has gone for us today than the struggle I was having with that outer one last time. Um, and that's trying to fit it to a pretty precise fit, right? The other one it was fitting. I mean, they were both precise, but we weren't nesting on the outer one. We were just framing the piece. Um, so in this one, I will stay away from John's method going forward. That's my take away from this one. I don't say that about many things that he's taught me, but <laughs> any questions out there? 
sometimes it's just what works for you. Like for yes. me, when I, I did something like that, I didn't do the inner. I just did a strip. I soldered it in a strip and a strip to hold it in. Nice. I didn't do the whole thing because the measurements were driving me nuts. Yeah. So you mean like you took a, a little uh, bezel strip and folded it inside of the inner piece instead of, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the full height. It's totally okay. What are you showing us? Hang on a sec. Let me spotlight you. Ooh, you're getting so close. That looks great. You got a little bit of, I guess the focus is hard for me. I'm, does it look like you, are you, are you having a little bit of gapping on your inner? Is that what a I'm seeing? A little bit of gapping on the seam. I cut it too short. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so have you soldered that yet? Or is that? No, no, okay. there's too many gaps. There's too many so but your gap is really about that seam point, right? So all you need to be doing is this same squeezing I was just doing. You have you, smaller than it should be is great. Bigger than it should be is a pain in the butt because you have to oh, cut something down, yay, right? Okay, so you're good. in good shape, right? You're in good shape. Okay. Just like if you were doing a round one and the round didn't fit inside the round, you're going to just stretch. It's just that you have to figure out which segments need the stretch in it. So yeah, that's and it, recoverable. And it's a cushion cut. Yep. And it's not meeting in those rounded corners so using those round parallel pliers might help yes yeah so round or i would actually be doing a lot of my cushion cut with half round pliers um because what i like about half round is if you're in a corner and you take a half round to it you can get the gentle consistent point curve that you can't get, like round pliers won't do that. Round pliers just go, get out of my way. Whereas the half round pliers, you put them across. Let me draw this one because I'm my hands well, are definitely not. And as you're doing that, Rachel, I can't get half round pliers. Small in, enough? Small uh, enough. Yeah, so, I, haven't found, I haven't found half rounds in this um, tiny set, unfortunately. It's the, the shape they don't do. Um, do you have... Uh, so the other thing you can do is either if you ha if you have any of the plastic pliers, you can reshape them. Would you spotlight yourself and oh yes, Sorry. I can see you. Yeah, okay. So the plastic pliers that are they get mangled really easy, but you can file and shape them yourself. I've they just never put seen those. Strength. Yeah, they Where are. Where did you get them? Uh, IV products out of Seattle, and I got them. I want to say auto fry, maybe. Um, it was oh. a Jane Redman recommendation, and they come in a few different shapes. They are not useful except when they are, is what I would say about it. Like they are, they're not strong. Oh. They got a metal frame inside of them, little wire frame, but they're not strong enough to really bully your metal. They're only good for well annealed soft adjustments, right? So that's but one option. But they're stronger than the Delrin. So, no, they're so they're wussy, like they're they're at once st solid and wussy. Like they, ca I can't, I can't maneuver metal, but I can use it as a brace and do things around it, kind of thing. Okay. So in that tiny corner, you could shape one to your needs. But before you bother spending money on that, you could also take a really, really narrow pair of um, flat pliers. Mm -hmm. And put them, this is what I got to draw for you. Put them, uh, where's my wipes? I about to use my new shirt and I didn't want to. Um, so you would do this. If you've got your corner that is not quite doing what you want, right? So this is your wall, your outer wall oh, there. Make your camera go down to what oh you're doing. Got to get my zooms. So if this is your corner that is not quite the shape you want and you're trying to get it to do a little bit of a bowing out to make it a little more curved, what you do is you put your pair of flat pliers here and here and you're gently squeezing with your emphasis being on pushing this one in and keeping this one in place. And what that does, because you've centered yourself on the point that you're folding around, is it does a more even push out. And then you do a little sort of torque twist side to side 
to further adjust the curve. And I do that with like very little pressure, super little pressure. It's more fulcrum action. But, than it but is. your units are not together, that you have to take that inside one out to do that, right? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're so if you have not soldered them and they're not and they're gapping, you have to fix the inner one to the size that you want for the outer one. Once they're soldered together, you can do this action to all of the, the, the whole unit, but it becomes a little more challenging if like the top of it is a little less distorted than the bottom or vice versa, because you're not getting a clean fit. So ideally you're shaping your outside one to exactly the shape you want. And then you're matching your inside one to that shape with stretching and, and, and adjustments and then making it do that very hard needs to be hammered in to fit model, right? So perfect world is good outside shape, match it with the good inside shape. But if you can't and you realize it's distorted a little bit while you're soldering it together, you can still do this kind of corrective action after they're a, a team, after they're soldered together. Okay. Um, so try that first. And if that doesn't do it, then go find yourself a pair of modifiable plastics that you can file down. Or oh, you might find well, whichever well. comes first. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if this is ready out of the pickle. A sec, I'm just closing up my curtains. My neighbors don't need to see what I'm doing. Thank uh, you. Pardon? I said thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Give me the courage to go back and work on it. <laughs> yeah, and cushion cuts are so beautiful in their set. Well, um, just keep an eye on with cushion cuts. I don't know if we talked about this. I think I did a square cushion cut at one point. Um, sometimes their um, belly is so rounded in such weird angles relative to the corners. And what I mean by that is they get, they get sort of, they get bellied. Bold. Yeah. Say that again. Bellied. Yeah, they get bellied, but like not in the way that something like this is going to get bellied, but they get curves here where it gets in the way. Don't hesitate to file the internal corners, not just with the usual round burr bit hole, but to actually take away on your inside. If this were my the corner that I were working on, before I even solder it in, I could take it down in the corners before I push it inside of the other one huh. or I can put sometimes you need to go the other way and you need to put a curve along the inside wall to accommodate the belly that's the real challenge with them is that sometimes their belly part is on the side and sometimes it's at the corners um, so you may have to do a little accommodation filing before you solder it in place okay so we have this good basic frame with some really blobby solder that I got at the end there when it was too grubby. There's definitely going to need to be a second pass at filling, um, but I want to first cut away my excess because I'm really well soldered on the inside line of it. I've only got two little spots where I'm not seeing the solder come through. So first action is cut off my excess. Get that blob of solder took out my saw blade.
Oh my goodness. Must be the hardest bit of solder in the world. I'll get some of that out of the way before I go further. I'm gonna clip some of it out of the way. It's so obnoxious. Maybe, maybe not. I have little scraps of solder nesting in my hair because they've gone flinging themselves up. Try slightly heavier gauge saw blade. that little ring of excess material, but I've still got some grub. I'm gonna quickly pop over to my grinder so we're not here for hours as I sand. And I'll be right back with you. So one of the things I love about the grinder is that it makes pretty clear pretty quickly where our gaps are by the time we're done because I zip down and I can see gapping, gapping, and a teeny tiny little bit of gapping at the corners there. So what I'm going to do before I go further, first I'm going to take the little burr that comes from doing a grinding off all the way around. And then I'm going to do a um, another pinch with my parallel pliers or my square pliers. Just Wait, so what are you burring off? <clears throat> what was that? I'm burring off this. So when you use a heavy weight grinder, it just leaves a burr edge inside and outside of everything. So I'm just cleaning it out. Okay. Just getting that little bit of rough stuff around the outer edges and the inner edges. Um, and then I'm going to take my pliers and, oops, not that pair, though. that's a specialty pair, um, squeeze a little bit to close my gapping. So I'm basically bullying it to be closer than it was on those corners, which means when I do get it to flow again, it should flow nicely into the small little bits of cracks that I have left. Do I have anything like that up front? Tiny little squeeze up front. And let's pop back over and do one more pass with the solder. This time I'm going to use chip because I really don't want to flood everything. I just have a little left to do. I'm going to dip the whole thing since my trip flux is jammed right now. back up to temp. Don't be surprised if you haven't rinsed it well, if you see a little spitting of color of the whatever little bits of the uh, um, pickle that you have left in there are. But know that it does indicate that you should be rinsing a little more thoroughly, even if it needs a baking soda rinse in between.
So again, just putting a little bit in the spaces that I know have gaps and getting it to flow again. Watch them as they flow to try to control where they head. They should do capillary action the way we want, but they don't always. Sometimes they misbehave. Uh, most of them, I got a little bit more in this corner that needs to fill. Boom. I would say we're in good shape. I fix the stuff up front too when I did that. One little corner up front. And done. All right, gang. We have a bezel. We have Woo -woo. a bezel that is soldered all the way through. That is Yay. solid. That is square. Yay. And it's going to go in the pickle for a bit. And we'll chat a small smidge while we wait for that to come back out. That was worth redoing. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so a couple things. Um, so we have two sessions left in this year, assuming people actually are interested in meeting the Wednesday before Christmas. That's Wednesday, December 20th. So we would be meeting November 15th, which is a week and a half in front of Thanksgiving. And then we would be meeting the December 20th. If there's going to be nobody on screen, then I'm not going to have it on the 20th, and we'll roll into the first of the year to try and finish up the project. Um, but what I would like to do, now that we've done this emerald cut, um, we have the slotted card cutting cut setting, the faceted slotted cut. Um, and the other one that I had promised you guys was an abstract, um, you know, a, an unusual cut stone, which honestly is easier than the emerald cut. It's just the precision, same precision we've been using with that. So if you want to see that, I'll still do it, in which case we'll need probably one more session after the first of the year. Um, but if you feel like you get the gist of the approach you would take for an unusual set cutting, given what I've just shown you today, which is do each, each wall a piece at a time, make sure you've got your fitting, and then work the under piece. So I, I would treat it, you will see me do exactly the steps we did today. It's just that instead of having eight, eight segments of two sizes, two sizes, and four sizes, um, or four of one size rather, um, you would be doing each wall independent and you might have some concave and convex curvature depending on how funky your stone is. Um, so I can still do that if you want. Well, I find that very interesting, but Rachel, you have given us so much, so I really feel like it's up to you, you know, if you want to take that on or not, but I would enjoy seeing it. So maybe what we do is if you guys are thinking you will at least follow along for a bit on the next round that I'll talk about what happens, you guys have been asking me what happens after Cogswell. Maybe what I'll plan on doing is incorporating one of those into my redesigns so that we go over... The, that as rather than trying to make it part of something that's not really in John's book, um, I'll make sure that we cover it in the in the subsequent project or projects, whatever it becomes. Um, and that way we'll do that that card cut faceted setting as our last make it setting. And then we have to set this one we've just done. Uh, and we have both the prong and the uh, step trillion to set. I was going to try and do that today, but I think we're pretty much maxed. Um, and then we'd we when we make the cards cut setting, we we set it as part of the set, the creation of that setting. The way that one works. So that's what we've got. We got three to set to finish out our our list, um, and one more to make <laughs> um, in the next two to three sessions. Um, if we if we jam out on it, if we can get it all solid and we can do the card cut setting in one sitting, um, then what we can do is 
uh, do all of our final setting of stones and bring our favorite drink and sort of toast the end of that project um, before Christmas. Um, and then next year, what I want to do is what I'm calling revitalize, redesign, and repurpose, which is that magical tour of all of my half-finished projects. Um, and that'll be a lot more talk about design and concept and uh, and it'll cover a gamut of different approaches because I'll be working on whatever grabs me to redesign and re rework. Um, either finishing a project that I was excited about and get reinvigorated about and showing you why I've chosen what I've chosen or saying, wow, I stopped this for a reason. How do I make these components into something that I enjoy? Um, and in this iteration of it, I'm going to encourage people to bring along a project of their own and we'll do some discussion of what's got you stuck and what could get you past it. Um, so it'll it'll probably be, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how long I'm committing to on that, but it'll be a few different projects over the course of the year because these are going to be longer working projects. Um, but it's still meeting once a month and then it'll be all over the map for what I'm doing. There'll be some chain making in there. There'll be some bezel setting or other types of stone setting. There'll be some hollow form work because you know how much I love hollow forms. It'll depend on the needs of the project. Um, also, given that a lot of my projects that are in the backlog are big, there's probably some connectivity stuff going on. How do I decide how I'm joining pieces together? Um, so it'll be a little, a, little, a little crazy and a little bit of, what do I like and what do I not like? And what do I what do I want to design? A lot more philosophizing, um, but also hopefully more engaging for you guys to do with some hands-on, here's where I got stuck kind of Q&A and you'll get feedback from others in the t on the group, on the call. Thoughts? Yeah, How's that sound? For me. That's, that's good for me. you, Betsy? Good. Sure. Okay. I know there's only three of you on at this point, but you are the deciding voting committee on this one. So <laughs> as you lose. <laughs> um, okay, do, you got, do the three of you have any strong thoughts? Should I skip December 20th? Is it too close to Christmas? I'm available, but whatever you want to do, because you've really put in a lot of time, like Wendy said, you know, so, so I think we should leave that to you. What you think, what you feel best about. We don't want you feel feeling guilty if you don't do it but we you know but if if you know if you'd like to have you know, a little month off or something it's okay with me um so i i actively avoid going home at christmas because i hate new england winters um so i go i go in advance of the holiday so i hopefully miss the snow and stuff um so i tend to my my holiday is a nice delightful relaxing chill out at home with the kitty cats and not stress over any of my jobs kind of thing um so i'm happy to meet and I would be happy to sort of like, I feel like I don't want the, the project to fizzle on an end note of, wah, wah, you know, nobody shows up and we're not, we're not doing anything, um, which is why I'm, I'm okay either way. It just sort of feels fitting to have a two year conclusion because we started the very first Wednesday of 20, good God, what is it? 22. And we've been doing this for two years at that point. So if we can avoid going into 24 I would love to sort of conclude you're, you're good with, yeah no no commitments one way or the other but if you can make it you can make it or are you out of town or I'm, I'm oh. looking at the next one is the 15th of November the next one is November 15th mm -hmm. and that will be um the cut the slotted cut card setting and maybe if there's time, although I doubt there will be, we'll try to set one of our three still need to be set settings in addition to it. And then December 20th, we'd be trying to wrap up finishing the actual setting of whatever we have left to physically set. And maybe bring your favorite beverage and we will chat and enjoy the conclusion of the project. Good for and me. And I will be setting up a separate Zoom for the next project because I suspect the hundred something people that have signed up collectively for these Zoom settings.
probably and haven't been showing up probably don't want to keep getting messages about a new project. So I'm going to send out a one final, hey, we're wrapping the project on this date and here's the next project, but you have to sign up again if you want to be part of it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. you may get new people. Or even, yeah. you know, making making that December 20th shorter, 4.30 to... Oh, yeah, yeah. If we don't have, if we don't have enough people or conversation or beverages, yeah, it's going to be really, <laughs> uh, it's going to be hopefully just the, in fact, I'll probably try to leave some of the easiest settings. I'll probably try to get the emerald cut setting set next time and leave the two trillions, which are much easier for our final setting or maybe we'll get through more i don't know i can always hope um so it's more casual catch up than it is work but yeah it doesn't have to go full full time so we'll play it by ear but the goal is conclude in december at this point right yes any show and tell any show and tell you got show and tell yeah i never get show and tell for guys let's see what we got replace spotlight Show me what you got. Ooh. Gold bezels on silver? Gold bezels on silver with a plume agate. Wow. Gorgeous color. Pretty. And um did you fabric did you fabricate or forge the ring band itself? What was the what was your process in this? I used <clears throat> a ring bender. So just very heavy gauge. Heavy gauge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. I even scribed my yes. so it says mom, 22 carat. <laughs> is it going to your mother? No, it? it's going to my daughter. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Can we see it on you? Well, I don't wear big rings. I don't wear rings, period. So uh, that's stunning. Yes. Absolutely stunning. Does she know it's coming? It. Huh? Does she know it's coming or is it a surprise holiday gift or something? Um, she knows it. No, she's getting the little tiny one that has a spinel in it. So this is just kind of, I took another class, daughter, you get the, you get the end result. <laughs> nice. What was the, what was the workshop? It was Alex Boyd with the Pocosin. Nice. Heaps. Yeah, yeah. That's <clears> fantastic. I just uh, enjoy doing the gold bezels. So that's why I signed up for it. Now, is, is that gold. his technique of doing gold edging to the bezels and not the whole bezel is, is gold? Or is it, is he actually, are you actually framing the whole stone in gold? Because he does, doesn't he isn't, he, isn't Alex the one that does that, like, sort of bottom is silver and blackened and the top is gold? Right, right. Yeah, no, that's, and he cuts his stone so that he doesn't have to use, you know, a full width bezel. He shortens the bezel, the gold around it cool but those are full height gold oh yeah that's stunning that is a stunning look thank you nice I did something. Yay! <laughs> and good. what i had to do is that when i went to set this the whole top fell off because it wasn't soldered strong enough so oh. i had to send it back to him and he welded it Oh no! You mean you <laughs> already set one of the stones? I already set one of the stones. <laughs> so. Oh no! Oh, oh but I'm glad. What What wasn't soldered? The gold, or what wasn't soldered? What wasn't? I had soldered. You know, you solder from underneath. You solder that, and then I set uh -huh. the small stone. Mm -hmm. And then I went to set the larger stone, and the mm -hmm. whole. Oh, the whole setting oh. fell off. Oh, the, the from the from the plate up went fell from off. The plate. Good, that was an easy fix. Got it. Yeah, so Got he it. welded that on. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Um, good it's job. That happens, That's awesome. But it's nice that it got re He was able to do it for yeah. him. Yeah. 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 It's always good it's to know someone with a lame welder. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford one, but someday. Yeah. Someday. <laughs> uh, Carmen, you got anything for us? Or Betsy? Nothing no, I got nothing. <laughs> okay. 
All right, well, then let's call it. Oh, I got to pull it out of the pickle so you guys can see our current end product until it needs its filing and sanding and all. But let me rinse that and show you what we got. <clears throat> Brush off. And then, then, almost. Needs a lot of sanding, but let's take a peek. Dun -dun -dun. Oh, I've got a spotlight, don't I? Oh, wow, that looks good. Dun, dun, dun. We have nice, clean fill. Let me yes. zoom in for you. Really good. Much happier with this one. Oh, my gosh. Zoom where I want you to zoom. Much happier with this one. I'm glad I redid the exterior before we went further, because I would have been unhappy with it. I got some blobby solder from that last pass. So I got to clean up, but super tight on that and no more gaps. So when we file and sand that down, it'll be nice and solid. It'll be in good shape. And where's my stone? I'm not going to force force this in here because I don't want to risk my corners, but we're going to have a nice set for that. I may have to make it into something. That's what I was going to say. Before I can set this one, I may have to make something on which it goes because I'm not sure I want to waste this nice stone <laughs> just sitting around yeah. in, in a demo. And the bezel is so great. I mean, I, I love the thick I, bezel. I, like say that. no to that. So thank you for following me on this crazy journey of finally getting a satisfactory setting for an emerald cut step bezel. Um, we nice did job, Rachel. Thanks. Yeah, we did successfully yeah, do the uh, the the basket setting for that, so I'm not going to repeat that one. But um, in fact, I've repeated it several times for myself because I wanted more practice on it. But um, that's in the earlier videos. And I will see you next on Wednesday, November fifteenth, and we'll go yes. from there. Yeah. Yay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.